close uh, the re the what is it? Because it's been two, it's been three weeks since I last spoke. So mm -hmm. our theme for the month um, is is um, kind of uh, diverted a little bit. We we had Bill Clark do a forgiveness talk, and we had Vince P. Pasqual do his talk on simplicity last week. So we're bringing to a close what I began the first two weeks in order in August, the 10 demandments of the universe, if you remember. So, the demandments of, demandments of the universe, okay, are the demandments that the universe makes of us. It's not what I make of you, what Joyful Gathering makes, but the universe makes these demandments of us. And what it is, is us opening up to and moving us internally, within, so that we can we can express and demonstrate an opening movement externally. We create, we co-create. So our external circumstances take place within. They take place within. So the Ten Demandments of the Universe, which if met, will cause you to be a catalyst for good. Isn't that great? Don't you want to be a catalyst for good? Yeah. I do. In your life and in your world in your world, setting, setting a really strong intention. You are a powerful creator of your experiences. You are, each one is, a co-creator with that intelligent force to co-create a life that you, you would like to experience. Because stuff happens in life, okay? Stuff happens in life, but you still have choice on how to respond to the stuff that takes place. Do you align, as in Carol's reading, do you align with the good, with the source energy of God? The vortex, we just finished that, that's all that uh, Jerry and Esther Hicks work and the Abraham work. And it's aligning, being in the vortex, which is the same thing in religious science term as aligning with the good of the divine. Aligning with all of the many different aspects of, of God, which is good. God is good. So we are very powerful creators. When we get our minds right, after, and well, getting our minds, getting our minds right is the important part of demonstrating. It's the key. Bringing the idea of our mind right back to our theme, which was Recess from recession, that was the theme for the month. Our founder, Ernest Holmes, tells us in his book that we are going to be using in our spiritual practice, one of the books, there's three in that class, spiritual practices class, and this is called Can We Talk to God by Ernest Holmes. And I'm gonna quote what he says. Prosperity is inevitable if a person's mind is right. So the question of this morning is, are you in your right mind? <laughs> Are you in your right mind? So Ernest Holmes went on to write about that, thinking of the blue moon and lunacy. I don't know why, it just popped in my head. Um, but it's getting into our right minds, no matter what is going on around us. And this is what Ernest Holmes also wrote. God has given each and every one of us the power to receive the riches of the universe, and that power is our thinking. <clears throat> Do it through our thinking. And so the first two weeks in August, when we explored the nine, the first nine of the Ten Demandments, all of which go to changing our thinking and then changing the emotional vibration within us, which creates also. And as you, if you do remember, I couldn't squeeze all 10 demandments in those first two weeks. And, and the 10th one felt so important and powerful and goes to um, Carol Mayo's reading on God being the cause. So I just want to go real fast through what the 10 were. And I'm going to change the, I changed the thou, and I'm going to change the shout. I just can't say shout. Okay, so <laughs> it's going to be shout. Okay, so the first one was, I shall make no graven mental images of lack. Second one, I shall not speak the word of lack or limitation. 
third, I shall trust the promise of abundance. The fourth, I shall listen and follow Spirit's guide. Sign. Fifth, I shall forgive. Six, I shall not covet that which is another. Seven, I shall keep my wealth in circulation. Eight, I shall not steal from myself. Do that a lot. Nine, I shall have an attitude of gratitude. And the tenth was, is for today, I shall not look to no other source but God for my supply. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. Because today's talk is entitled, The Father's Good Pleasure. And obviously that was taken from, I know that Carol mentioned Luke. So this is from Luke 12. And it says in, in the Bible, it is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. We've all heard that. And I've been quoting this month from the Lanzer interpretation of the Bible. And it reads, your Father is pleased to give you the kingdom. Do you have your right mind around this concept? See. That is, do you really believe it? Do you really believe that all the abundance of the universe is there already? It's already here for you to tap into and to use. It's the belief. It's the faith. It's the trust that this actually exists. For us, it's the Father's good pleasure to give it to us. Are we receiving it? <clears throat> and I understand that your reactions and feelings, and thus your beliefs, because that's what attributes to them, around the statement may be affected by your relationship with your earthly father, as well as religious upbringing. So if you had a, a punishing, unloving father, or were raised in a religion where God the Father was demanding, judgmental, and angry, then you will most likely bring that emotional, psychological, and spiritual baggage to that statement of the Father. So it doesn't give us a lot of comfort then if we got stuff around the word Father. It doesn't give us a lot of comfort when we say it's the Father's good pleasure. But we're gonna, we're gonna look at that later on, the, uh, the Father. But right now, I want us to move into, thou shalt look to no other source but God for thy supply. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're going to talk about that. And we'll return to the, the other part, which will be about it. It's the Father's good, king, uh, good pleasure to give us the kingdom. We'll talk about that later. But right now we're going to talk about God being the source of our supply. Because this is such an important concept for all of us to really deepen into. And it really does take a lifetime, I think, of, of clarifying to deepen into and having that faith, as I spoke of, that there is this faith in this one power for good, this, this supply of abundance that is always there. It's so important. And it doesn't mean that we should sit in a corner and ohm our way through life. Just sit there and, and med meditation is great. Chanting is great. But we can't expect things to just drop out of the sky. There is also this activity in chanting and meditation and prayer great activity, but we also have to have movement in our, in our physical, we have to do some kind of action. You know, whether it's just picking up the phone, whatever it is, having a conversation, whatever it is. But what we really need, what we really, really, really need though, is a shift in our consciousness. And our consciousness is our awareness, our spiritual awareness, that we really believe that God is the source of that supply. The source, and I know that many of us, and this is, this is the challenging part, many of us believe the jobs, our investments, the child support, whatever it is, is our source. We believe that that is our source. No, it's God is the source. These are all avenues. These are vehicles, channels through which spirit expresses. It's, it expresses, and when we really step out of the way, there are so many other channels and sources and avenues that open up to bring us 
our good in, in forms that we could not even imagine. But first, we have to have that faith, that belief. Step out, trust that the universe always supplies your good. That's, that's the key. So we say it a lot, but do we really believe it? Do we really believe that the job is not our source? Or however you get your money is not our source. It's not. It's one channel, two channels. There are endless, limitless channels. Ernest Holmes says succinctly in his Science of Mind book, mm -hmm. the substance of the spirit is my daily supply. Mm -hmm. The substance of the spirit. We'll talk about that next, uh, next week about substance. And he wrote about that also. He said, God is the giver and the sustainer of human life and expression. God is all there is. God is the substance and supply. We must learn to accept this. It is God's pleasure to give us the kingdom. Then it should be our privilege to accept it. And he also writes, there is only one substance out of which everything is made. Cabbages and kings, hands and houses, money and men. Or, and this is another statement that's I really like this statement. There is a great mystery, the limitless wonder of the universe. God is that which out of nothing, out of nothing, can make something. It's nothing is really the substance. It's nothing is really the substance of everything. You all get that? <laughs> in Genesis in the first chapter God said let there be light there was no light and all there was light instantly out of nothingness God creates this is the creative genius that has created each and every one of us that is expressing in and through us so that's how we co-create we can make things out of nothing using our imagination our ideas our vision we create it's, it's, it's a wonderful thing and that's why it's important to be aligned with that creative force. That's why it's so important, this work that we are doing. The spiritual, and I always call it practical because it is, practical work, spiritual work that we are doing here. It's so important. So where did Ernest Holmes get all of his ideas from? Got them from a lot of different incredible teachers. You know, he was uh, born in the, the late 1800s. And he, there, were, there was a lot of New Thought movement going on at that point, but he also got, he got most of his wisdom through studying the Bible. As a child, he studied the Bible all the time. And <clears throat> this whole spiritual system that he developed, which is science of mind, um, he got from this sacred text from the Bible, studying the Bible. So we're going to look at, real briefly, some of the biblical passages that I'm sure that he used as a source of his belief. He said, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That pretty much sums it up. In the beginning, he created everything. Everything you could ever want, need, or desire, and like I said, is already created, is already present. We might not be seeing it demonstrated because maybe we're not clear enough. Our vision and our, our hearts and our minds are not open enough to claim it, but it's already present. So does this mean that it has been manifested in physical form here? Does that mean that there was harnessed electricity during Adam and Eve's day? Does this mean there were microwaves, televisions, and computers? when Moses was with us? Does it mean that we currently have all the means, for example, to get off our dependency of fossil fuel? Does it mean that? No, it doesn't mean any of those things. But what it does mean is that the spiritual principles, which is metaphysical for heaven, spiritual principles, and all the substance, earth, necessary to manifest these things, were, are, and always will be in existence. 
The law of electricity has always existed. This is just one. It's always been there. But un unless we know how to use it and harness it, we can't. We can't understand it. We can't use it. So it's our job to expand our consciousness. Always expanding. And that's really, really deepening and clarifying our understanding of, of spiritual principle. That's why we have so many classes teaching this over and over. That's why I'm in every single class. Because I need to learn this over and over again. Because it's always unfolding. And it gets clearer and clearer and clearer. The more that we study it, believe it, and align with it. In the beginning then, God created heaven and earth. Heaven being that spiritual principle, earth being the substance. We are told there is only one source of all wealth, and that source is God. And the Bible also says, the silver is mine, the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. So the Bible, that everything, so the Bible says that everything has been in existence since the beginning. It's always been here. And everything belongs to God, right? God is, there is nothing outside of this creative energy. There is nothing outside of it. It's created all that is, was, and ever shall be. But it goes even further, and in many places tells us it is God's intention to supply it to us and to meet all of our needs. This, the substance of spirit is my daily supply. Great affirmation. The substance of spirit is my daily supply. Aren't we told in some of the most beautiful words in the Bible, which are found in the 23rd Psalm, which is like a favorite of a lot of people, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Thou preparest a table before me, in the presence of mine enemies, thou anointest my head in oil, and my cup runneth over. There is always more than enough. There is never need, really, to compete. To create, yes. To compete, no. It doesn't even feel good to compete. To create, that is being in alignment with that supply which is always present. And in the Philippians, it says, and my God will supply every need of yours. And we have Corinthians. But as it is written, I, I, hath not seen nor ear heard, <coughs> neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God had prepared for them that love him. So we have no idea of how much good is available to us. The infinite possibilities, the infinite supply, but when we deepen our faith into God as our source of our supply, that's when, and we have to open up and allow it and trust that it's taking place, and it does take place. It does take place. So our theme, on our theme of words of the day from Luke, fear not, little flock, for it is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. God is the source of all that is. Everything has existed since the beginning. God wants to supply it to us, to meet our every need. And will just keep pouring it over us. My cup runneth over. I just love that. Just saying that, it feels good. My cup runneth over. Everybody say it. Feels good up here. <laughs> <laughs> really saying that to yourself when you think there's lack of limitation, go back to that. My cup runneth over with good of every kind. So, in order to be truly <coughs> prosperous, and I think we all want to be prosperous, don't we? We want to be successful, we want to experience lots of good things things in our life, in economic good times or bad, we can still be prosperous. We absolutely, though, must have a shift in our consciousness. We must have that shift in consciousness. And that's <coughs> our work, our activity to do. And so we start to begin to embody the idea 
that I need to shift my consciousness, shift my thinking to there is only one source and substance of our supply, and that source is God, the Father. And so we return to the idea then of God, the Father, because that's what the talk's called. So when we think of the divine ideal of the term Father, what do we think of? We think of provider, protector, supporter, giver, it's this giving force of love and light and abundance. But for sometimes it, these words, words can trigger in certain people different, different kinds of feelings. So for those who had fathers who were at the other end of that spectrum from these qualities that I just spoke of, having an infinitely larger version of that is in the form of God really isn't that company. When we say God the Father, it might, it might not feel right to you. And I usually don't even say that. But for this talk, I will. Because I think we really need to clarify and heal and move through a lot of these, these concepts around that word. So for, for me personally, I didn't have a father that was abusive. He checked out pretty early in life with alcohol, very early. But he wasn't abusive. But just don't call it Mother God, though. <laughs> because that's where that would trigger stuff for me. <laughs> See, the, the Father God, that doesn't trigger anything. He doesn't have any issues around Father, you know? But if it was Mother God, that's why you'll never hear me say Father, Mother God. I usually just say God. But anyway. But I did a lot of forgiveness work around Mother. So that's why we're doing the radical forgiveness yet again in December, because I wanted to do it around the holidays. So we'll do it at the very beginning of December. For those of you who are going through holidays and need to do a lot of forgiveness work, and we all need to do forgiveness work all of the time, it is never over. If you think it is, think again. Some people show up. There is always someone with something to forgive. So here's an interesting piece of, of information that I do want to share with you. In the 2008 Science of Mind magazine, Rocco Errico, and, and a lot of us in New Thought have heard of his interpretations. He does um, New Thought Bible, metaphysical Bible interpretations, and he's a scholar. He tells us when Jesus, this is interesting, referred to God as the Father, in the context of his language, Jesus' language and the time, it was a term of endearment and not necessary, not necessarily a reference to God as a masculine role. Father simply meant beloved. That's what I thought it was really. Erico wrote that among Aramaic and Arabic speaking people, sisters and brothers, mothers and fathers called each other father. So one sister will call her sister father, and a mother will call her son father. And, and, and a father can do the same thing. It's, it was a term of endearment. So how does this sound? Fear not, little flock, for it is your beloved's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. It's a shift in words. Just to sh that's all we have to do with any concept where we find that it triggers something in us. Shift it to another word, the beloved instead of father. So it's the beloved's good pleasure to, to give us the kingdom. Are you ready to receive it? Well, yes. are you? Yes. 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 Of course. <laughs> Wake up. All right. So then let us release any negative energy we might have around the old idea of God as this punishing, angry, judgmental father to the beloved, who's its great pleasure to give us all good. That is what we teach here in this unity of life, a loving God that gives to all that it creates. And I want to conclude this morning's um, talk with a short meditation. Well, it's not a real meditation, but Ernest Holmes called him that. It's like a reading from him. And so it is where he wrote, the substance of the spirit is my daily supply. I cannot be without my good. I can see the constant stream of life flowing to me. Brings, 
into my experience all that makes life happy and worthwhile. I rest in the security knowing that infinite good is within and is expressing through me. I receive my good. And this from Emma Curtis Hopkins. Life is good. Good is God. This life is God, and all is well. And so it is. So it is.